This was the first part of the gardens to be developed. In those days, this whole area was reclaimed land. Gardens by the Bay was my retirement project. <laughs> it allowed me to turn into reality some of the dreams and things that I imagined. What was the image I would like to leave in visitors' minds of Singapore when they come visit? How could I make gardens by the bay to form that green necklace behind which modern Singapore would rise? To be the green lungs for the city that was going to grow up. It has been evolving from a simpler concept to one that's increasingly more diverse and with many levels and depths. Hi, my name is Ganesh. I'm working in Gardens by the Way for the last 10 years. My role as a duty officer in ticketing and attraction department. Morning everyone, morning guys. Morning, morning. Okay, so a couple things happening for today, so let's take note. My team consists of almost 30 hours staff for per shift. So to cover the various attractions within the gardens, we need to deploy them at these locations. Checking our facilities, make sure that facilities are well kept for. Usually what I do, I'll go in, I'll check on the facilities. I'll check on the cleanliness, uh, make sure there's no obstruction to get uh, for any guest experience. So before we commence our operations. Good morning. My favorite part of my garden is always the super trees. When I first joined, uh, the super trees looked very skeleton with no plants. I would say it easily took five, six years for the plants to grow up the super trees. Over the years, it started looking very much like a, like a big tree. Big trees that need a lot of work to upkeep. So what we see right now is the workers carrying out plant maintenance work so and replacing some of the plants uh, as required. I'm Liang Fa, I'm the Deputy Director of the Gardens Operations. I've joined Gardens by the Bay since 2019 in October. Uh, I'm currently in charge of a team of horticulturists uh, maintaining the outdoor gardens of Gardens by the Bay. Okay, so this whole process of going through the entire super tree, checking the plant's health, watering the plant's cleaning, performing cleansing works, will actually take up to two weeks per super tree. So day to day, we will do like plant maintenance to make sure that all our plants are in tip-top condition. Gardens by the Bay is home to 18 super trees, with 12 here in the super tree grove. These iconic giants were designed to simulate real trees in the rainforest. Marrying the form and function of mature trees, they support a living skin of epiphytes, ferns and flowering climbers. We are right now within the super tree itself, the irrigation system that supply water to the plants on the entire super tree. So similar to what a normal tree does, it functions like the roots to absorb water and then bring it up to supply to the leaves. So this uh, irrigation pipe actually runs across the entire super tree in a spiraling motion, supplying water to every single plant on the tree itself. When I just joined gardens, I joined as the head of security. Um, I manage a team of security staff, uh, ensuring day-to-day -day security operations of Gardens by the Bay. After joining the gardens, I have a lot of opportunity to, you know, to interact with uh, the horticulturists. I really gave fond interest of uh, horticultural works. So after about two years, I was given the opportunity to, you know, join the horticulture operations team. After I took on the new role, the first thing I did was to go around the gardens to learn the different plant names, which is very challenging at the time. There's a lot to remember. There's a lot of plants in the gardens that are from worldwide, not very commonly seen in other parts of Singapore. So it took me quite a while to pick up uh, most of the plant names within uh, my area of charge. 
Installed on just the super trees alone, there are over 162,000 plants from over 200 species. They were all arranged and secured on customized panels before being raised up and positioned on the trunks. On the super trees are mostly uh, some of the specialized climbers, forest climbers like Bauhinias that you see in the Golden Garden. Um, you see Bougainvilleas in the Silver Garden and uh, a lot of other bromeliads and uh, epiphytic plants like orchids, ferns and all that. Hi, I'm Gary Chua. Um, I'm the Senior Director of Garden Operations uh, Department as well as the Director of the Design Development Department. I have been in the garden since 2011 when they started uh, all the planting of the gardens including the installation of the super trees and all that so it has been about 11 years since then. One of the very common questions that we get from visitors who we bring up here is uh, do the plants actually grow all the way to the top? But essentially if you look at the tallest super tree there, you see a very clear line between the plants and the crown of the super tree. If we were to allow plants to grow all the way to the top, you actually Essentially, you don't see the crown, you don't see the very nice architectural branches of the tree itself. That makes it so unique. This deliberate design has made the super trees a distinctive visual landmark in Singapore for over the past 10 years. The super trees design is uh, symbolic of the creative thinking and innovation of the Gardens by the Bay. Um, in fact, when we have the first super trees, Skyrise Greenery was nothing new in Singapore, but it is the first time that we brought Skyrise Greenery to such heights uh, through the look and feel of the super trees. But at the same time, I think it is also symbolic of uh, Singapore itself in the sense that with uh, very limited resources, we were able to create something on a site that was formerly reclaimed land. One of the key challenges of uh, building such things on the reclaimed land is essentially the ground itself is very soft. So uh, a lot of the buildings here, including the super trees, are the only things that were piled. So piling was actually done around this to ensure that they could uh, withstand the time and without any soil settlement issues in place. The super trees are not just an aesthetic and engineering marvel. Some are equipped with eco-friendly features. My name is Addison Goh. Uh, I work at Gardens as the Senior Director for Attraction Operations, Sustainability, Tech and Innovation Offices. So if you look over on that side, um, trees usually collect sunlight, so as such, uh, 11 of our trees actually have solar panels on top. Uh, they help to take and garner uh, solar energy, uh, convert it into electricity that we use every night uh, to power our, elect uh, our light show. In total, there are more than 600 solar panels in gardens by the bay, generating more than 67,000 kilowatt hour of electricity per year. Uh, in addition, uh, some trees also uh, help to act as chimneys for us. Uh, so three of them over on that side uh, help to expel warm air or draw in warm air uh, from the environment uh, itself to actually uh, be used in our biomass plant. Uh, one particular tree towards my front uh, acts as a chimney. Uh, after we actually burn um, the biomass itself, it actually expels it, um, clean flu gas out to the environment. At night, the super trees dazzle crowds with their signature light and sound show. In total, for the Garden Rhapsody system, the lights elements, we have about 3,000 lighting fixtures and also 200 meters LED strips. For the operation team, uh, before the light show starts, what they do is that they will be going to the server side of things to ensure that uh, the audio system the lighting system and the control systems are working fine so that we do not uh, have any hiccups when the show is about to start. And uh, following that, they will actually await the show controller to start the show automatically. Once that is started, they will move out of the server room and actually walk around all the super trees to check all the speakers 
are not giving out any distorted audio or they are at the correct level. And then they walk around the super tree to see also the lights are actually behaving what they're supposed to be doing. Gardens by the Bay, when it was first conceptualised, was supposed to be developed as a people's garden. They wanted to create a signature uh, event that would actually cement the people to bring them here from time to time to enjoy the gardens. So the Garden Rhapsody was conceptualised with that in mind. When you see people enjoying the whole feel of people and all that, everybody has a smile on their face, even though the light and sound show is just about 10 minutes. Uh, but everybody goes away feeling very happy and excited. Beyond the super trees, plants from around the world thriving right here in Singapore. The super trees are more than an iconic landmark in Singapore. They also play a vital role in the running of the garden's other landmark, the two glass conservatories. We're one of the first in the world to have reverse greenhouses. So instead of uh, keeping a greenhouse warm, we actually cool it. Uh, so plants from Mediterranean uh, temperate climates can be showcased over here. Temperatures in the domes range between 23 and 25 degrees Celsius, and they're kept chilled by cutting-edge, environmentally sustainable methods. On a daily basis, uh, about 60 to 70 tonnes of uh, wood waste or horticultural waste, basically dead leaves, twigs, uh, branches, uh, they have fallen all across Singapore and is gathered, uh, brought over to our back of house. Uh, these eventually go to our boiler that is then uh, in turn used to generate um, steam. Um, and it turns the steam turbines that in turn generates electricity that we then use to actually power our domes. Waste heat from the boiler itself is used for removing uh, moisture from our liquid desiccants that help to actually reduce the moisture within the air uh, and hence reduce the cooling loads or the cooling requirements for the air itself. From the onset, the engineers were challenged with a mammoth task um, to reduce uh, energy usage in our domes. They did a couple of ways. They installed spectrally selective glass or treated glass um, where it reflects almost 65% of the solar heat. However, it still allows a light to come in uh, so we can actually have our trees bloom and our flowers uh, grow as well. Nearly 6,000 pieces of the customised, state-of-the-art, double-glazed glass panels were used to construct the flower dome and cloud forest. At the top of the greenhouses, one set of glass panels was designed to function as ventilators, letting out excess heat. We also deployed sails or little, I guess, shifts over on, on the outside of it. So on days where it's very bright and very hot, um, we are able to activate these sails or uh, shades to actually cover, uh, thus reducing um, the energy uh, cooling needs required. Cloud Forest is the taller of the two conservatories, housing one of the largest indoor waterfalls in the world. In there, the humidity is 80 to 90 percent, replicating the misty conditions found in tropical mountain regions. Lush vegetation native to those habitats cover the mountain structure within. So, Cloud Forest is about conservation, about raising awareness of conservation. 
Hi, I'm Janice. I'm part of the conservatory team that helps look after the cloud forest. Cloud forest in the wild is declining rapidly, also because of um, population growth, changes in land use as well as climate change. So we hope that by bringing the different plants that is hard to see in different cloud forest climate, it also will help to raise awareness in the importance of conservation in the face of climate change. We actually do the monitoring of our plants to ensure that they have the best growing um, conditions. So what they are doing now is checking the nozzles of the misting system so that the water can come out nicely. They actually have to check that the nozzles are not blocked. Every one of the nozzle along the Club Forest mountain has to be checked. So this misting system actually helps us mimic the effect of cloud forest in the natural environment. It not only um, has this really cool and nice effect, this misting actually helps to maintain the high humidity inside cloud forest. They do the maintenance every once a month, so that's when the big boom lift can actually come into the dome during closure. It's the day that we do not have any visitors around. So it's the best time for our big uh, machineries to actually come in to help with our maintenance. You can see that the mountain behind is actually one of the most difficult parts to do maintenance. That we will need big boom lifts to come in to help with the weeding as well as the pruning and replacements of plants. Because of the fogging, so this creates um, more algae growth than usual. So on closure day, we also jet wash the floor so that it is not too slippery for our visitors. So that's one of the process that we do to upkeep our dome for our visitors. The cloud forest is now home to over 72,000 plants, including some vulnerable species, all looked after by horticulturalists who have been trained specifically to take care of these special and unique plants. Hi, I'm Zana, a horticulturist from the Research and Horticulture Department. Working uh, in a plant nursery is like uh, working in a plant hospital. So I'm the doctor. I have to take care of them when they are affected by pests or diseases. So we take care of them until they grow into better health and then they can go out to the gardens again for display and then visitors can enjoy them. The most satisfying part is when you nurse after your sick plants and then they recover. And then you grow a plant from seeds or cuttings and then when they grow into a mature plant, you send them out for display or permanent planting. Something that I'm proud of is of course the orchid display in cloud forest which we have uh, annually. Um, it's a thematic display that articulates on the importance of orchids uh, and then we introduce uh, how a hybridization program is important. Since 2015, I'm heavily involved with the orchid hybridization program. We are trying to hybridize um, highland and lowland orchids. There's orchids from the highland region, from the mountainous uh, areas like the Andes or Himalayas, and then the lowland tropical orchids from Asia or even South America like the Amazon rainforest. Complementing the cloud forest is the flower dome. It is the largest glass greenhouse in the world, and inside, the cool, dry climate of the Mediterranean and semi-arid subtropical regions of the world is replicated. Flower Dome is designed to bring a world of temperate 
flowers and plants to Singapore. And we use it to showcase plants from the Mediterranean climatic regions of the world. This includes Chile and Argentina in South America, Southwest Western Australia and South Africa. My name is Mikhail. Um, I'm currently with the Conservatory Operations Department, so I help a team of colleagues to take care of uh, the Flower Dome, um, as well as Club Forest. We have quite a team of people who help maintain this facility. So this includes, uh, on my end, lots of people who are in our horticultural team who help look after the plants inside here. And they're aided by our volunteers who come in almost on a daily basis to help look after the plants. More than 10 years ago, I joined the gardens to be a gardener. So a lot of things that we did were, there was no way to mentally prepare for this. The glass was not fully up on the top of this building. Uh, there was definitely no air conditioning. So as the glass got put on, it became hotter and hotter and hotter every single day. Um, it was really dusty. There was a lot of trial and error. Um, and also being in a confined space, we had to figure out where the lorries could park how far their arm could swing, which direction the arm could swing, the angle that we could plant these trees in, and of course, taking care of the trees themselves. Displaying temperate blooms on such a scale in Singapore might have been unfathomable before. But over the years, the Flower Dome has delighted visitors with its many different floral displays. I like that we're able to bring people on a journey without even leaving Singapore, without even using their passports. We were able to do, for example, a Kazakhstan-themed tulip mania. So this brought people to a place in the world that's really hard to access for Singaporeans. You know, there's no direct flights there. And they were able to come and see a blooming tulip field, a Kazakh yurt, an authentic Kazakh yurt filled with furniture. It was really nice to see people coming here, taking photos. Um, some of them were even dressed up, and that was really quite cute to see. So we have an upcoming Seasons of Bloom display, which acts as our year-end finale. Um, it's a Christmas-themed display. So we've got quite a chaotic work night tonight. Um, as you can see, we've got workers planting. We have Ikebana artists who are putting up uh, their Ikebana, which is really nice, actually. Uh, we're also tweaking the lighting that we have here inside the Flower Dome. Uh, we're doing lots of touch-up to our props. And in case you haven't seen it, we are also going to be installing the ice cave. I used to get really excited when plants are starting to bloom. That, that used to get me really excited. But over time, I feel more rewarded when I see uh, visitors happy in the space, when they are interacting with our exhibits and building memories and creating experiences. That, that really um, is a driving force for me at the moment. Surrounding the star attractions, the outdoor spaces of Gardens by the Bay, where communities are flourishing. I'm Felix. Uh, I've been with Gardens for nine years and the last four years as Chief Executive. A lot of people then say that this um, is a tourist attraction. In fact, it was created primarily for Singapore and Singaporeans. If you've uh, been to New York, there's the Central Park there. Olmsted, the uh, famous creator of it, uh, saw public gardens as a social equaliser. You know, people from all walks of life can walk into it, uh, have access to it, and so, Guns by the Bay, being in the heart of the new downtown, stems from that vision, which is why we got very jealousy to keep 95% of our gardens ungated, open free space with different programs to line them up and make this truly a people's garden. And as with all other parts of Gardens by the Bay, these open free spaces in the outdoor gardens are also taken care of by many teams of dedicated people. The key part of it, I think in most of us who chose this profession, is really the passion. We 
understood that uh, we have a calling and, and, and we love nature and we wanted to share this with the rest of, of the world and I think that's what motivates us. I'm Ching Hong, uh, I'm an assistant manager in Garden Operations and uh, I joined the Garden in 2009 as Garden's first intern. I'm in charge of the, some parts of the outdoor gardens, mainly on the maintenance and landscaping, which uh, includes the aesthetic, cleanliness, as well as the uh, general beauty of the garden. When I was young, I used to watch nature documentary with my grandfather. That sparks uh, my interest in plants. Working on with plants are like dealing with living arts. Whether or not it complements a landscape depends on how skillful an, an individual horticulturist is. The thing that still keeps me excited is due to the vast collection of plants. And because tropical plants, the flowering periods are quite uh, unpredictable. So every day, we see something new blooming around the garden. On top of my usual horticulture job scope, every day I have to head over to the floral fantasy to feed the poison dart frogs. Floral fantasy opened in 2019. It was part of Gardens by the Bay's expansion efforts to bring in more than 150 species of rare and unique plants. It is also home to various species of the colourful poison dart frogs. I'm now currently collecting the lightless fruit fly for the dark frog. These are their food, their main source of food. Taking care of the frogs is not something horticulturists get to do. At that time, we have a new attraction and I brought it up to the management that, you know, maybe we can keep some frogs uh, as an attraction. And from that day onwards, um, I became one of the caretakers for the frogs. What I most like about my job is to be given the opportunity and exposure to not just growing tropical plants, but also rare and uncommon uh, species that's not from this region. And what really thrills me is um, not only being able to just take care of them, I'm also being tasked to select them and introduce them to the garden and also giving the visitors a chance to take a look at them and to learn more about them. In addition to feeding their passion for plants, Gardens by the Bay has been more than just a workplace for the staff here. The garden is definitely life-changing for me personally because I've been here for the past 10 years. Over the years, I've met many colleagues uh, with similar hobbies and interests. We grew into good friends. And apart from that, I also met someone who is willing to walk the rest of my life together with me. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ruby. I'm an assistant manager in garden operations. Uh, prior to that, I've been in the conservatory primarily in Club Forest for 10 years. In Garden Ops, what I do on a daily basis are the maintenance, keeping the outlook and beautifying the gardens, as well as I get to decide on the plant selection suitable for the gardens. I think people feel that taking care of plants is easy because they cannot talk. But I think that is why this is a challenging job, because they cannot tell you whether they are doing good or whether they are not. So you have to learn through observing their signs and symptoms. And then after that, we explore more to discover whether they are happy or not. Getting more people to appreciate plants is what Gardens by the Bay wants to do. More than 10,000 square metres of the outdoor gardens 
is now designed for communities to create new experiences together. Hi, my name is Debbie and I'm in charge of the education team at Gardens by the Bay. I curate content for our educational programs or even our public programs. I think it's common to see people kind of like strolling through the gardens for various reasons, either they're, like they're walking their dog or you know they come here for a picnic with their families. Um, but I think what we want to focus on is also going beyond that and kind of finding ways to pique people's interest and get them interested in plants. Earlier this year, we launched uh, Active Garden. It's a new area within the gardens where we have sort of designated it as a community space. We want to encourage community groups to come in, uh, organise their own activities. And it's also a spot where we have an edible garden. So we have workshops that teach um, the public how to, you know, plant um, seeds from scratch, you know, and, and stuff that they can nurture at home. Uh, we provide them with a lot of tips and tricks on how to do that well. Education has been an important mission for Gardens by the Bay since its early days. More than just teaching the public about plants, the team is now focused on nurturing a culture of sustainability in the next generation. Hi girls, how's everything? Hi, what are you looking for? Ooh, okay, make your way to Olive Grove. Do you know if you're at Olive Grove already? Yeah, we're already at Olive Grove. Ah, okay. <laughs> so they're talking. <laughs> we're always excited when we see kids in the gardens because they bring a very different energy. And for the gardens, what we definitely want to aim to do is that at every point um, when a child is growing up and at a different stage in their lives, I think we want to find ways in which to connect with them and for them to find the gardens relevant. Race to Sustainability is a signature post-exam program for us that we started and introduced in 2015. So actually this year, it's many years already. And this year being our 10th year anniversary, we thought we wanted to make it special. And also it's pretty much the first time since we've seen this many students in the gardens after COVID started. So we're very, very happy to see all of them running around and being very excited to explore the gardens and to learn new things about sustainability, biodiversity and conservation. Have you all enjoyed the race so far? Yeah. Okay, okay. It's so fun, right? It, does this beat like being in the classroom? Yeah. Kingfisher Wetlands is actually a, quite a new location to the garden, so we wanted to definitely highlight that. And also because Kingfisher Wetlands features mangrove trees, true mangrove trees, mangrove associates, which we wanted to point out can actually store blue carbon and is therefore able to help us in terms of conservation and to fight climate change. So it's definitely something that we thought we would want to highlight to the students as part of Race to Sustainability. More than 200 native mangroves have been planted here, supporting research into blue carbon science. In the Kingfisher wetland, there's a whole team behind it because uh, it's talking about blue carbon, capturing. You know, mangroves are carbon sink. Essentially, they trap carbon dioxide and sink them up in the roots. Uh, if this is successful, uh, we can actually replicate, not just locally, but internationally. And I think this is a role that Singapore Gardens by Bay can play. When Gardens was created, I think the founding team foresaw a future where sustainability will be a hot button issue. The word climate change and climate crisis were not fully you know, in, in everyone's vocabulary. But we always think ahead. And the whole Gardens was created because we want to share this love of nature with the world. So both at the infrastructure level as, as well as the outreach level, I think these are things uh, uh, we hope that will help make a, a difference uh, going forward. And today, Singapore has a Gardens by the Bay rooted in their far-sighted past, with branches reaching out for the future.
By 2020, Gardens by the Bay was welcoming millions of visitors a year. And then the pandemic hit. The pandemic changed a lot of things. Uh, from the visitorship, it dropped tremendously because it came to a point that totally there were no visitors at all. So uh, it was something very sad sight to see that from a place where it's so bustling in crowd, but suddenly it came to zero. So I was quite scared to see that part. COVID was actually really tough, especially for, I think, our horticulture staff. A lot of my staff wanted to come back to work and take care of their plants. The last thing you want is to be cooped up for a couple of months and then come back and everything's died. And all your hard work has, has basically come to nothing. So overnight, our revenues nose dive when the borders close. And then we have to very quickly reorganise our business, rationalise our cost structures, and then at the same time keep the place going. Gardens by the Bay is venturing online, taking nature to the people. Now, the gardens are closed during the circuit breaker, but you can now take a virtual tour featuring plants in the flower dome. Horticulturalists have also created videos providing tips for those who fancy creating their own garden at home. Others supported the nation's efforts against COVID-19. When we had cut down the manpower, our staff took on different roles. I was attached to the community care facility. So for three months, me and some of my team members from Gardens, we went there and supported the dormitory workers. Of course, with every you know, crisis, there's always a uh, silver lining. Uh, we learn a lot from the experience as well. I realise that many of our operations are quite minor, uh, la very labour-intensive. Uh, we decided to start a smart garden project using technology. We also had the opportunity to pivot uh, to new businesses. Uh, of course, online was one of them. And then uh, through the school programme, which is, say, the Green Guardian programme. With restrictions eased and visitors back, the gardens is springing back to life just as it did from a germ of an idea planted 16 years ago. When I first joined in 2006, I think the team was very small. I think it was only about 12 to 15 of us. By the time I was overseeing the business plans for the gardens while it's being uh, constructed. I'm Jason, I'm the Director for Attraction Operations. Basically, I oversee the uh, frontline uh, attraction operations as well as security in Gardens by the Bay and uh, making sure that uh, all these uh, functions um, uh, operate smoothly uh, on a daily basis to ensure the uh, best experience for our visitors. When I first joined in 2006, the atmosphere was quite tight-knit, very family-like kind of atmosphere. It also feels like a startup. We were all housed in this uh, small bungalow house office in Botanic Gardens before we move over to the site office in uh, Marina South. When we first looked at the designs itself, we were wondering, oh, <laughs> has it been done before? Can it really work out? Or is it going to be a spectacular failure? I think we just have that trust in uh, what Dr Tan's vision is. That belief and that trust was so strong that we never think that failure is an option. We were targeting to get the gardens ready and open June 2012. <laughs> Right till the very last minute, we were still trying to get ready. I remember the first day we had an opening ceremony by our Prime Minister. Gardens by the Bay would be an icon of the redeveloped Marina Bay and a jewel in the skyline of Singapore City. And I encourage all Singaporeans to visit the gardens and to embrace them as our very own. When the gardens open, there's no turning back. <laughs> you can have all the plans and all the preparations, uh, but you can never be fully ready. You don't close the gardens to say, OK, um, let's regroup, restart, and then go all over. It was a difficult period at that time. 
everyone have to chip in. But I think all these um, um, difficulties and coming together, uh, everyone putting in the extra, extra effort and so on, help to bond the team closer, as well as uh, develop this, this sense of team spirit uh, among us. From a tightly knit team of 15, the Gardens family has grown to over 300 employees. To create a place like Gardens by the Bay, uh, a one-person effort is never enough. It takes a whole community to create a world-class garden. Most important is actually Singaporeans themselves. Uh, they give us a lot of encouragement, give us a lot of feedback. I read all the feedback personally and I must say that often there are times uh, we disappoint, we didn't do as right, but our desire is always to make it right. And, and I'm very proud, my, my 300 staff, uh, they always put their best foot forward. I'd like to see um, us reaching out to people who are not ordinarily gardens visitors. I really want to see them come and visit the gardens. And to do that, we really have to step up our game um, and give them better reasons to come to the gardens. When we try to brainstorm for new ideas, to reimagine the different landscape that we have here, to create a new different experience for our visitors anytime that they come and visit, to bring a sense of wonder to our visitors. Moving forward, we're definitely looking at exploring more obscure parts of the gardens where we can bring some programs to um, and hopefully activate that space and also allow people to appreciate what's in that vicinity. We want to do our part uh, for climate change. We are working out a decarbonisation um, strategy and a plan. Uh, to achieve net zero in the near future. More importantly, is also to see whether we can um, work uh, with the public and the visitors alike to encourage them to recycle and reuse, and this hopefully will translate uh, into a greater impact uh, for that fight against climate change. So we cannot uh, rest on our laurels, but we have to keep innovating, basically think of new ideas and bring in events and activities that will continue to engage the audiences, local and overseas. One thing that I think my team feel very strong about is that our focus is really about, our core business is really about plants. It's really about sharing this love uh, with the public. We now have the honour of Madam President and Deputy Prime Minister kick off the celebrations with the unveiling of Perpetual Blooms. Thank you Madam President and Deputy Prime Minister. So this year is our 10th anniversary and we wanted to celebrate this uh, occasion with those that have supported us uh, so much during the last 10 years. And uh, finally, we also want to appreciate among this group of supporters um, the special ones that has uh, made uh, the gardens as successful as it has been um, today. Ten years on, Gardens by the Bay has become one of the world's top horticultural destinations, welcoming more than 89 million visitors from around the world to date. I'd like to extend my heartiest congratulations to everyone at Gardens by the Bay on this very important and significant milestone. And we all look forward to a bright future for the gardens in the next decade and beyond. For me, what is special is that 10 years on, Singaporeans have believed in us. More and more uh, people uh, talk about Gardens by the Bay as an icon of sustainability, icon of innovation and come to Singapore, it is a must visit. Uh, that makes us really proud and uh, we are happy, my 300 colleagues, that uh, in a small way, we are the face of Singapore to the world. This dream. Then I'll be an old man sitting here <laughs> looking at this. I think 10 years from now, uh, this would be a very exciting place. The Founders Memorial would have been up. Uh, we are starting work on Bay East Garden uh, to make it a, a waterfront garden uh, with uh, the Founders Memorial 
uh, as the centerpiece. Uh, this is the yin to the yang of, of Bay South currently. Uh, and I think we will have to think of how we can activate uh, these two gardens in synergy uh, to see how we can build connections across so that the visitors uh, who come and visit uh, Gardens by Bay can also come and uh, see what is the core values that our founding fathers uh, have created. I think the most important part, now at sunset you cannot see, but the greenery, you must keep the two patches. Huh? This is uh, Dr Tan's uh, constant uh, reminder to me that we have to preserve the view from this side. We evolved along with Singapore as Singapore grew uh, in terms of numbers and in terms of prosperity. Gardens by the Bay has survived and matured and it gives me much confidence that the next 10 years will take the same trajectory. 10 years from now, I hope that the gardens will keep its relevancy to Singapore. That means that it is actually growing in step with our population, their needs, their requirements, their composition.